evening. Thanks very much for coming on this uh, pre-snowy night, but I'm not supposed to say things like that, am I? We're Seattleites, and we know that uh, a little snow doesn't intimidate us. It'll be gone with a light rain. It'll follow. My very pleasant assignment is to talk about the historical perspective of Downton Abbey, and especially what was going on in the Pacific Northwest and in specifically in Seattle. At the time, many of these adventures of the Granthams and the Crawleys were going on in Yorkshire. So I want to start out with uh, some kind of fun comparisons, if you don't mind. It's always interesting to look at two or three areas and see how they are similar or dissimilar. Similarities. Seattle is the largest city in the Pacific Northwest. Yorkshire is the largest county in England. Also, by the way, another similarity is there's a flower involved. Did you know that? The white rose for Yorkshire, a very, very important symbol to English historians. And we have the rhododendron. That's our state flower. But on the eastern side, the rhododendron does not always looked at with favor in the wheat fields of, of the Palouse. Uh, similarities, people began to appear in Yorkshire and Northern England and Scotland about 10,000 years ago. That's after the Pleistocene area, the Ice Age, moved back, leaving striations in the rock, and uh, people began to drift in from who knows where, Asia, Africa, perhaps parts of Europe, but that's a very long story there. The same thing happened here. If you talk to your native friends here, Native American friends, they'll say that in this part of the world, people began to appear 12,000 years ago. That's about when there were little sprigs of uh, uh, birch and weeds and flowers beginning to grow, which brought in animals, which brought in people to kill the animals and keep alive. Another similarity. Both areas are drained by rivers, very important rivers. Yorkshire's got a number of them and uh, keeps the area moving, keeps it clean. It's also, by the way, important to the towns of York and Sheffield so that they have industry, opportunities to ship things in and out. Then another thing that's a similarity, but this really happened all over the world and mostly, of course, in developing countries, and that's the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution got well underway, of course, in the early 1700s, but it really got moving later on, especially in England, and many, many cases on the east coast of the United States at about the same time, first in England, of course, and in the European continent. By late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution was frankly dominating the social life, the cultural life, and certainly the commercial life of both these areas and many other areas. Just for quick examples, steam, harnessing steam, water power, Machine tools were invented and crushed and graded and cut and did things never before, never before. And that changed a lot of things, of course, in both worlds. Another similarity, and this is a curious one, and those of you who are local Seattleites will find uh, this, uh, I think, interesting. There was uh, a lot of uh, trade union organizations rising at about the same time to meet management's uh, pro issues, management's point of view, and it resulted in some radicalism. Now, in the case of Seattle, probably the most famous example would be the IWW, the Wobblies, which also had their day in Portland and had their day in, in uh, other parts of the state, but mainly Seattle, and of course the Seattle General Strike, and there's a nice exhibit about that, by the way, upstairs, which involved Anna Louise Strong, some of you remember that, and the mayor of the city at the time was Ole Hansen. And uh, the p police were called, and the, and the military was called out, and uh, Ole Hansen uh, waved his hands and waved his arms and said, the radicals, the Bolsheviks, are going to take us all over. Well, it petered out after a while, but it was a very, very important aspect of both areas. And the radicalization that occurred in Yorkshire, especially in Sheffield and in York, was very similar. Very similar, as a matter of fact, and sometimes it got a little nasty. Differences, major differences, I think. Well, for one thing, we in the, in the Pacific Northwest, and in Seattle in, in particular, don't have really a record of invaders going back. 
The only other people who were here were the Native Americans, and most likely they came either by boat or by land bridge across the Beringia area in what is now Alaska, and worked their way down the uh, North American continent and then the South American continent. That wasn't an invasion. There, were out, there weren't that many of them. They took good care of the land. They hunted for food, and they provided uh, housing, and they had uh, activities in this state and not too far from here uh, in the Palouse, and uh, a lot of the river areas, Columbia River, like uh, Kennewick Man and so forth. Well, in the case of Yorkshire, it was a different story. You had the, uh, the uh, Celts who were here for quite a long time. Then you had the Romans who came in for about 80 years, dominated the world. They were followed by the Danes. Uh, the Denmark was, uh, by the way, a very strong country in those times. And one of the words that we had surviving from the case of uh, the, the Danes was Jorvik, Jorvik, which has become York or Yorkshire. And the Danes, of course, took time to spend some, some issues in uh, Greenland and elsewhere, too. Another difference in the West, and it's been my experience in my writing and research, that uh, we look westward and have looked westward probably before Thomas Jefferson, certainly with Thomas Jefferson when he sent out Lewis and Clark, 1804 to 1806, there's no question the idea was to get west, the western limits of the North American continent into America as part of the whole country. And that's been going on even today to some extent. We keep moving, we keep looking, we keep looking to the west. Some people don't like what we do to certain these uh, areas in the west, but that was what Americans and especially Westerners have always thought. Now among the people who looked west and made something out of it, and there were many, I'm just gonna give you a couple of quick examples, was James J. Hill, president of the uh, Great Northern Railroad, came out of St. Paul, Minnesota. He lived next to a gentleman named Frederick Warehouser, literally next door in St. Paul, and they were close friends. And uh, James J. Hill had come into a vast resource by the federal government to build a railroad across the North American continent, the United States. And he said, after he got his uh, uh, issues straightened out with his own railroad uh, plans, he said to Frederick Warehouser, who was born in Germany, by the way, uh, said to him, over cigars and brandy, it's believed, at least by some of the biographers, why don't you come west too? By then, Warehouser had cut down most of the trees in Wisconsin and, and, and other places. And in those days, there was no replanting. You understand what I'm saying. So Warehouser thought that was a great idea, so he paid $6 an acre for 90,000 acres in the state of Washington. And he came out, and Warehouser to this day is a very reputable and, and very fine company, more on the real estate issues now than they are in the, in the wood products. But that's an example of coming west. Now, in the case of Yorkshire and England in general, at the same time, it wasn't going looking west or looking east. It was preserving an empire. The empire was South Africa. The empire was India. The empire, of course, was Australia and New Zealand. That's what they wanted to preserve. That was their west. That was important to them. So the point of view was different. One was to preserve and perhaps expand to some extent, and the other was to keep stretching. And that was the American point of view. Another difference, by the way, uh, that I have perceived, and you're welcome to discuss this with me or with other panelists as you see fit, I wrote one of my books is a history of religion in the Pacific Northwest. It's called Roots and Branches. And the religions that were established out here were mostly as a result of either the Indian spiritual activities, very wonderful chapter on that, but then the rest were missionaries who came out and struggled. And the missionaries had to also plow the fields and fish and get along with everybody else. So they were hard working people. But religious influences in Yorkshire were quite different and they were established religions. And they built many of the abbeys, in case, in, in fact, one of the most important today in Yorkshire is called Fountains Abbey. And no doubt, the writers of the show uh, thought about all this. Uh, the religious uh, activities in the Yorkshire has always been an important part of its history. Now, I'm just gonna quickly mention uh, some of the writers that discuss this, so you can you can think about that a little bit. In the case, of course, of the West, the Western United States, 
We have Vernon Louis Parrington, who wrote Main Currents of American Thought, who won the Pulitzer Prize out here from the University of Washington in 1928. He died in 1929, the next year, very sad situation. But he was a Western-looking man and talked about the West and talked about the industrial and the social and the cultural issues of the United States at the time. But he had that in mind. Another, of course, just to give you another name to think about, who spent some time here, not much. He spent one night in jail, actually, in Port Townsend. That was Jack London. Mm -hmm. Jack London came through here on the way, of course, to the north and was very, very interested in what was going on up there, as well as the Oakland area, California, and many other places. He was a Western-oriented writer. I'm just leaving you with those two. There are many others. Now, to set the scene for Downton Abbey, we are fortunate if, uh, if uh, uh, you have any experience with previous shows like this, like Upstairs, Downstairs, or Brideshead Revisited, and so forth, the scene was set by somebody who knows what he was talking about, Julian Fellows. Julian Fellows did the writing of the uh, Downton Abbey show. Uh, he was interviewed a couple of times and asked, uh, why is this such a popular show and so successful? He said, I haven't got a clue. I don't know. It worked. That's all he could say. Anyway, Julian Fellows went to public schools. That means private schools in England. Uh, he was a writer and an actor. And in fact, he was the writer of the script for Gosford Park, which won an Academy Award, made him very famous. And of course, he is a member of the House of Lords. He's called Baron Fellows. So he's of the manner born. And that probably was a very important aspect in him understanding what to put in the mouths of these various people, various actors, how they behaved, what they wore, but we're gonna hear more about that uh, too. Now, there were some uh, predecessors, as I said, upstairs, downstairs. The one I particularly like, and I have to mention it, was uh, Brideshead Revisited. Does some of you remember that? That was a very fascinating show, very wonderful. One of the reasons I liked it, it had Jeremy Irons in it, had Sir Laurence Olivier, uh, I think they're just top-notch. Of course, you have top-notch actors, too, in Downton Abbey, but I'm saying that was one that established a kind of a level, if you will. This all happened, by the way, um, under the uh, rule of a man named King George V. King George V was uh, the first Windsor. It was a German family, as you know, Mountbatten and so forth. It came from Germany. Changed the name to Windsor because the, the uh, winds of war were, were blowing at that time. He was a grandson of Queen Victoria. Now, what other influences, very quickly, very briefly, influences, of course, on Downton Abbey, some of you are well aware of this, was the, the fee tail or entail, today we call it primogenitor, which means only a, the, the eldest male member of a family can inherit the property. And you know the arguments going on about this, which really kicked off some of the major issues in this show. Uh, the firstborn child, is what they say, is the one that uh, uh, steps up and takes the property. Where did the rest of them go? They came to America, many of them, and made their fortunes in other ways out here. I wrote a history of Norwegian immigration to this area, and that's exactly what Norwegian people do, and including many single women came out here. They were 16 and 17 years old. They had no other place to go, no other place to go. Another influence at the time was the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. Uh, the loss of life on that was about equally divided uh, between aristocrats and emigrants. It was a shock. No one could believe that the Industrial Revolution would build this magnificent ship and it would hit an iceberg and go down in a matter of hours. So that was uh, something that uh, enthralled and obsessed many people, both, both ends, by the way, in Seattle area and certainly in Yorkshire. And the, uh, probably the largest influence, though, was the Great War. That means the First World War. The Great War has always been referred to, at least in historical. Uh, nine million people died. Nine million died. They were just fodder. They were just uh, on, the, on the fields, mostly of France and Belgium and Luxembourg and so forth. Uh, it caused political upheavals. Everybody knew somebody who had died or was wounded in the Great War, especially in Yorkshire, especially in England. They were the ones that lost the most first. The Americans came in very late in the game. And John Keegan, probably one of the outstanding, if not the best historian on the First World War, put it this way. That war, the Great War, 
caused the end of an age of vital optimism in British life. You no longer saw everything through rose-colored glasses. It was too terrible, too exciting. Another influence, we can't forget it, is the influenza. 1818, right during the Second War, it was called Spanish flu, but that's not fair. It didn't start in Spain. It really started in Kansas, probably. And it was spread mostly, people believe now, by troop movements. Going here, going there, settling there, people got influenza. And one little story in Seattle that might be of interest to some of you. You know who Mary McCarthy is, I think most of you, the very famous writer and critic, more a critic than a writer in my opinion, who wrote The Group, who was made into a film some years, some years back. Mary McCarthy ended up in Seattle because her parents were killed, were died because of the influenza. She was living back, back in the Midwest. <laughs> And she came out and lived with her maternal grandparents, whose name is Preston. And Preston Thorgerson Law, Law Firm is still very much uh, busy uh, here in Seattle to this day. Uh, she had a brother by the name Kevin who came out. She and her brother uh, survived and did well. Maybe you know who Kevin McCarthy is. Uh, he was the first uh, uh, actor to play the role of Biff in Death of a Salesman, Arthur Miller's play on Broadway. Won a uh, number of awards for it and went on to make uh, a lot of very interesting films. Then another influence, Irish Free State. There was an upheaval in Ireland at the time, and this had something to do with the stories of Downton Abbey and some of the people there. The Easter Rising, by the way, occurred in 1916. That's when things began to gel. People got upset. Some of the leaders, and this is the British, may, may have made a mistake with hindsight, they executed the leaders, executed them. So immediately the Irish, many of the Irish, turned their backs on England and that maybe hasn't changed that much to this day, to, for other reasons now, of course. Um, and so they were, didn't want to participate in the First World War, the Great War, and that caused uh, some issues. In Seattle, I'm just going to name, uh, cherry pick a couple of events uh, to let you know that there were very, very big projects going on here during the same period, but right in this city, the first one, of course, was the AYP, Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, and Paul has written a magnificent book about that, and if she wants to uh, pursue that some more, that's fine. The other was something called the Bogue Plan, B-O-G-U-E. Bogue was a city planner. He planned Tacoma. He planned other places all around. Came out here and had a, had a plan to remake the center of the city of Seattle. It was defeated in 1911, but it caused a great civic stir and a lot of excitement about the boat plan changing Seattle forever. It never happened, but it was ex very exciting. The Olmsteads, you know who they are, came out here in anticipation of the AYP, and they went elsewhere too. Uh, these are the Olmstead brothers. One was uh, a, a, a son, and the other was a stepson of Frederick Law Olmsted. But he changed his name to Olmsted, by the way. That's why they called the Olmsted brothers. Uh, they came out here in 1903 and a couple times after that to plan for the AYP exposition. And they left behind, in my opinion, one of the finest uh, park and boulevard uh, pro programs of any city in the United States. And the last thing that I want to mention very quickly is that uh, uh, Seattle began to annex, annex Ballard, annex towns all around, move south, Renton, all around, didn't take over Renton completely, but the areas around Renton they took. And so Seattle was stretching its muscles and becoming the major center of commerce and activity that it is. Uh, I uh, uh, have the names of several books. I'll just quickly read the, read the names just uh, so you can get them and you can come and write them down for me later if you wish in the question and answer period that suggest details about this period that we're all going to be discussing. One is a new book just out now called Servants. Have you seen it? It's by Lucy Lethridge. It just came out about five months ago. Fascinating. Servants, that's, that's the name of it, and how the servant class has changed over time, both in Europe, the continent, England, and the US. And it's very, very interesting to get a feel for what the servant level, the other culture, was about that time. The other is still also a new book by Margaret Macmillan, who wrote 1919. A uh, fascinating book. It's called The War That Ended Peace. It's a new book right now. And she's talking about the Great War and what happened there. And one also quite new, I'm right in the middle of it now, by A. Scott Berg. It's called Wilson, the biography of Woodrow Wilson. And of course, he was a major figure 
uh, representing the United States. And the last, it's a little fiction for you, Daisy Miller by Henry James. Henry James caught, I think, the feel of the Victorian people and of that time. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll have a seat here. Hi. Thank you guys so much for being here. I was so excited when I got the call asking would I be part of this History Cafe, and the person who invited me said, you know, I don't know if you know anything about this series, Downton Abbey. It probably would be helpful if you watched an episode or two. And I was like, I know, I know. <laughs> I can't wait for season four. Yes, yes. So um, this is great. It's great to be here. So I just have a couple of different things I want to talk about um, tonight. I want to talk about servants and how those compared. I brought a lot of sort of props with me here, so we'll get those arranged. I want to talk about servants, and I want to talk about death. Um, especially the kinds of death that we saw people suffer at the end of season three. And I have to tell you that this afternoon in preparation for this, I rewatched the death scenes and it was just as difficult as it was the first time around. So, um, so where's my clicker? Do we have the clicker? Lower shelf. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. So, uh, these are just snapshots. This is not meant to be inclusive. There's, this is a very rich period, obviously, both in um, Downton World and in Seattle. Um, servants in large houses. We see here Downton and we see a home in Seattle. I think I do have the, the um, houses on here, right? It's not on. On. Okay. Okay, this is the Carkeek Mansion which was um, up on uh, First Hill, uh, demolished in the 30s, yeah, in the 1930s. Morgan and Emily Carkeek are an interesting family to look at when you think about servants. These figures for servants that I'm getting are from the 1920 uh, federal census. And I just dipped in to people whose names I knew probably meant they would have big houses and saw who was enumerated as uh, servants in their houses. So what I'm getting from this really is only live-in servants. Um, Seattle, unlike Downton, we're expecting that you're going to find a lot more day servants than live-in servants. But in terms of um, the live-in servants for the Karkeeks, now the Karkeeks were British. So they came from a tradition m much like Downton, maybe not quite as, as, um, as grand. Um, this was their house, and in this house they had only one live-in servant, a Chinese uh, man who was their cook, uh, enumerated as Sam, only Sam, which is a common sort of term. As you see in some of the um, servants in Downton, not at Downton, but at, at other houses, they're given the same name. You know, Daisy could be Mary, but they call her Daisy. Um, that's not true at Downton. We know those servants better, and the family values those servants, but there were a lot of houses where if you were the first maid, you were called Maggie, whether that was your name or not. So the family never had to learn <laughs> a different Maggie. So the, the car kicks had a Sam. This is the Kinnear Mansion. And um, if you think about Seattle Center, and then you think right up above Seattle Center, uh, you think about the Bayview Retirement Home. That's what replaced the Kinnear Mansion. Yeah, um, the Kinnears, it's a little bit difficult to see who was living there in terms of servants because um, George, uh, who built this house, had died very recently before the 1920 census was enumerated. So his son and his wife were living there, but I was not able to find servants enumerated in this house. I imagine there were servants living there. This is another big house. These houses don't... I mean, they're not huge like Downton Abbey, right? We didn't have houses quite that grand here, and we certainly didn't have houses that sat on that amount of property. But we did have some really big houses. Uh, this was the Hoffius Mansion. I don't have figures on their um, servants. Uh, the Parker Mansion, uh, 1409 Prospect, was not enumerated with any servants. So they most likely had day servants. It's unlikely to me, I mean, I live in a really small house, <laughs> which I clean myself. Uh, if I lived in a house like that, I would at least have people coming in to, to do the cleaning, you know, especially in 1920 when electrical appliances were really, really new. Uh, might be a, an electric carpet sweeper or something like that, but nothing much grander than that. 
This is Orion Denny's house. Orion Denny is um, um, one of the children of the Denny party. Um, the first male, for the horse, first white male born in Seattle. Why do we keep track of those kinds of statistics? I don't know, but I imagine he was very proud of it his whole life. And probably all his friends at school knew. Um, <laughs> or maybe all his enemies, right? <laughs> um, he's, this one's a little tricky. Um, Orion, this is their house in Seattle. Um, they also had a house over in um, what's uh, now Kirkland. And uh, Orion had a really exciting life. He was married three times. Um, by the time the 1920 census came along, he'd been dead for, for four years. Um, his third wife was possibly living in the Kirkland house. She remarried at a certain point, went to Los Angeles, and committed suicide. So I'm not sure exactly what, <laughs> what the sequence of events was. But at any rate, in this big house, um, I did not see any servants enumerated here in 1920, which most likely means that the family wasn't there at that point. Um, and then this is a great house. Um, this is the Sam Hill Mansion. It's on Capitol Hill, um, quite near St. Mark's. If you know where St. Mark's Cathedral is and you look across the little ravine, you see Sam Hill's um, home there, built of concrete like the Mary Hill Museum, which was his big project in, in Goldendale, didn't build it as a museum, but was convinced to turn it into one. Um, Sam Hill had, uh, at this time, living in the home, two female servants, a woman, uh, Grace Diane, who was 25, and another woman, Alice Diane, who was 47. Both of them from England originally, I'm guessing mother and daughter. We don't know that for sure, but it seems um, like a likely possibility, and also a 30-year-old uh, chauffeur, a man who was born in Maine. Um, again, this, this house, it doesn't look as big in the picture. It is, it's huge, um, pretty large, and most certainly there would have been, I would guess, some day servants coming in and out. Oops, that's the end of that. Okay, well, I have one more. I'm gonna, I'll pop it back to, to Sam Hill's house. Um, also, Horace and Susan Henry, they're an interesting, an interesting couple. Um, they lived on Harvard Avenue. Um, those mansions over on Harvard Avenue, some of them have been demolished. The um, Henrys eventually gave their house to the Seattle Public Library, which declined to use it as a library, and there's long and interesting story about that on History Link. Um, they had more servants than anybody else that I've found so far. Uh, they had three female servants, one born in England, one in Sweden, and one, and then another in England who was 61. A male chauffeur, 21, born in Washington, and also his wife, who was 17, born in Washington. So that's approaching maybe the largest number of servants that in this very small sampling that I looked at, I was able to find. None of these servants um, were Japanese, but anecdotally, uh, a lot of the families in Seattle um, hired Japanese servants to come in, um, especially housemaids, cooks, chauffeurs, uh, also no Native Americans in this group. That earlier on in Seattle's history, a lot of the families would be hiring Native Americans to come in, especially and do um, laundry and um, cooking, things like that. So, the 1920 federal census in Seattle found 2,599 men and 2,816 women as domestic servants. Um, only four of them, all men, were enumerated as butlers. That's not a lot <laughs> for the whole city. We were not a very grand, uh, a grand um, place that needed a lot of, of Carsons. Um, <laughs> Only one male servant was enumerated as a footman. Um, more than half of the male servants were cooks. About 20% of the female servants were cooks. Eight of the women were ladies' maids. Again, that's, that's not a lot. 42 were nursemaids. And then 624 of the men and over 2,000 of the women are just listed as other servants. So, and that would include day servants, the people whose, whose profession was servant. That would pull in day and um, live in servants. Um, I'm very curious about, you know, where did the servants who were day servants live? How did they get to work? How were they treated? How much were they paid? I can tell you just a couple of uh, help wanteds 
give some indication of what they were, they were paid. I just took May 1st, 1920. We're talking about 1920 because I'm not entirely sure what year the fourth season is set in, but we know this is the early 20s. We know that we've just been through the 20, 1920 and season three, so this gives us a, a snapshot. Um, help wanted female, because of course at this time we're splitting female versus male. Uh, experienced cook for cooking and downstairs work in family of three adults and two small children, $65 a month. Um, competent second maid must have city references. That one doesn't have a, a, a rate. Girl for general housework, $60 a month, no washing call tomorrow. There are a lot of, of help wanted for uh, women domestics. Um, also an ad, I love this, Chorus Girls for Columbia Theater in Vancouver, BC. <laughs> I'm thinking if Cousin Rose were in Seattle, she might <laughs> want to take advantage of that. She's not experienced, though, as far as we know, in, in, that, in that arena. Um, help Wanted Men, there were not a lot on May the 1st. Um, there are some situations wanted men. I'll just read you one of those, or two of those. Uh, Japanese wishes steady position as second houseboy or butler in family, best references. Good luck with that butler, right, if there's only four of them. Um, active elderly man wants job as second cook, kitchen helper, dishwasher in small hotel, city or country. The other thing that I thought was really interesting in looking at the help wanted on May 1st, 1920, was that there was a category in the Seattle Times called Discharged Soldiers, Sailors, and Marines Seeking Employment. And it says, to aid the men who have defended the Union, the Times publishes these advertisements free of charge. So these are situations wanted if you'd served in the military. So that's what we have about servants <coughs> right now. Um, death and childbirth, right? I know a lot of people knew that was coming, I did not know it was coming. <laughs> and it, boy, that was an amazing and very sad moment in last season. I'm sorry if anyone here has not seen season three because this is full of spoilers, okay? <laughs> um, Lady Sybil dies from eclampsia. And a 1919 medical text tells us the name eclampsia has been used, uh, has been the use of that name has been restricted to convulsions caused by toxemia. So this was understood. This is the thing that I was curious about. OK, you know, <laughs> did they see this coming? Did people die of toxemia all the time? Uh, and so I, I checked out a whole bunch of different um, 1920s childbirth manuals, basically, or, or um, what to, this is the what to expect when you're expecting <laughs> of 1920. It's called Lectures of Interest to Women. <laughs> <laughs> and this was written by a Seattle obstetrician, Royal McClure. And it has an ad in the back for a Seattle maternity hospital that they're trying to, um, to get the money to build. And the only thing that it advises women is to watch out for swelling of the hands and feet. And it doesn't really exactly tell them why they should watch out for this, but it says if it happens, tell your doctor. Right? He'll take care of it. Um, that's not, in general, the most helpful advice. <laughs> um, this was a little bit better. This book is called The Expectant Mother. I was curious to see what kind of advice Lady Sybil might have been able to read if she had gotten a What to Expect book um, as compared to what a woman in Seattle might have been able to read. Um, this book is a lot better, and it was also published both in London and in Philadelphia, so perhaps it could have been here. Um, it goes into toxemia, preeclampsia, um, C-section. These, if anybody wants to look at these afterwards, they're very interesting. Cesarean section in 1920 was no, no easy thing because, right, why? Exactly, no antibiotics. That makes it a lot riskier. Um, this book was in print for decades, 1923, um, Getting Ready to Be a Mother. Not too helpful again, on toxemia, although it talks a lot about what kind of corset you should wear when you're pregnant. 
but it does mention convulsions. Um, the most the most explicit that it gets about what to watch out for when you're pregnant. This is under the category helping to prevent complications. You have probably learned in one way or another that the complications associated with childbirth are most that are most serious are infections, childbed fever, convulsions, um, abortions or miscarriages, and severe bleeding. But perhaps you have not heard that you yourself can help greatly in the prevention of all these conditions in your own case and chiefly by little more than exercising good common sense. Um, it's interesting because books that were more aimed at doctors talk about things like um, the regular prenatal appointments that, that we have now, basically the same schedule for women then. Um, this book, 1919, uh, John Cook, Hearst's Manual of, of Obstetrics, they're already sque screening urine, um, the schedule once a month and then every one or two, uh, every two weeks um, for the last three months, I think, of, of pregnancy, and then every week for the last month, and watching out for headaches, they're doing blood pressures. Um, this was a known, this was something that was known in good prenatal, prenatal care for Lady Sybil would have included regular um, examinations and screening of her urine. I'm not sure that Lady Sybil was getting such good prenatal care, I hate to say that, but um, you know, we know that uh, the Harley Street, the Harley Street specialist who was called in, who was, um, what was his name again? Sir, yeah, Sir Philip Tap. <laughs> Let's find him again. Um, Sir, T Sir Philip Tapson. So here, here's a quote from, um, from the, the last book that I was talking about. Now let us impress upon every pregnant woman how necessary it is to make frequent examinations of the urine during pregnancy. The urine should be examined every four weeks until the seventh month. During the seventh and eighth month, the urine should be examined every two weeks. Uh, the presence of albumin tells us we have serious complications. So that's what Dr. Clarkson saw, right, in Sybil. He was worried because she had albumin in her urine. He wanted to see the most recent specimen. Not sure why they were taking specimens when they didn't seem to be checking for albumin until he made a deal out of it. She seems muddled, he said, swollen ankles and a headache. Um, these are things that should have been picked up a lot earlier. I thought Sybil looked a little puffy from the time she first came back to downtown. <laughs> But then that's me. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't think she's ever seen for Sir Philip Tapsell before he walks in there for the dinner party. Um, and I also wonder, you know, about after her childbirth when he appears still in his blazing white dinner clothes. Didn't look like he was much help. Um, bottom line, being knighted does not make you a good obstetrician, apparently. Um, and I was very interested in, in finding statistics on home birth versus hospital birth, not because I in any way believe that home birth is um, more dangerous. I actually had two of my children at home, but what we're seeing in Downton is that um, the idea of moving toward a more medicalized childbirth is going to make it safer, and that means being in the hospital, right? We see Sybil die at home, and we see Mary safely give birth in the hospital. So one of the things that I was curious about, too, was um, how well did women here do, right? Toxemia and eclampsia. So looking at the 1920 Department of Health and Sanitation for Seattle report, I can tell you that um, Seattle's population in 1920, 319,659. The net deaths, um, 3,378 of which 1,457 were women. Um, of those women who died, the uh, women who were died from death in the purpural state, so during pregnancy, um, six of, there were 14 women in general who died from that, from that sort of general category. Six of those died from albumeria and convulsions, which is what Sybil died of, or basically toxemia. Um, there were 6,000, and 288 live births in Seattle and 208 births that were stillbirths. 
it's 36 maternal deaths overall. So that's a pretty high rate of maternal deaths for um, live births. It's 5.7 percent. It's a lot more than we would think was acceptable now, but um, that was what was going on in Seattle then. And then the last thing that I want to talk about is more death. <laughs> um, this time Matthews. Again, very sad. I did know that that was coming. But I was watching the show with my 15-year-old daughter, and she did not know that it was coming. And it was very traumatic, very traumatic. Um, the closest thing I could come to for in Seattle, a figure that would somehow tell us how many people were dying in automobile accidents in Seattle in 1920, was from the, um, the um, Seattle, um, again, the, the statistics from the Department of Health, which um, tell us that, let's see, where is that? Um, it it categorizes, categorizes trauma to trauma ta traumatism by machines. That's it, 12. So that could be threshing machines. I don't know, it could be all kinds of machines, but obviously cars falls into that. But the King County Coroner's Report um, was issued in 1919, and then we have another for 1931, apparently not between, but in 19, or 1917. In 1917, 32 people in King County suffered from automobile fatalities. And by 1931, that was up to 145. Now, it's very much worth noting, I think, that Washington State did not require a driver's license in, until 1921. Um, in 1921, they started requiring a driver's license, and the way that you got that was, wait for it, you got someone who had a driver's license and was of good repute in the community to vouch for you. <laughs> <laughs> Junius can drive, and so he would get a driver's license. Um, in 1933, we finally started testing for um, driver's licenses, and I have with me, and this is really cool, and you can look afterwards if you want, because it's checked out from the University of Washington Libraries, a 1936 Washington Motorist Manual, and it does cover reckless driving, and I'm sorry, I love Matthew too, but he was driving recklessly. <laughs> <laughs> he had a good reason, he was really happy, reckless driving doesn't have to be because you're mad or drunk, you know, he was just drunk with joy, but there you have it. And if he had been required to take a driver's license test, he might have maybe been looking at the road instead of up into the heavens. So <laughs> thank you guys so much. So I'm going to talk about fashion down Abbey in Seattle. Um, So one of the things that I really love about watching Downton Abbey is the fact that it highlights um, this particular period in fashion history, which um, one of the most dramatic changes in fashion happened during this time, which was in 1900, we had sort of the last vestiges of the Victorian era that was sort of curvy, corseted look with big skirts. And by the 1920s, you have this, this the ideal body is straight and columnar, and you have these little tiny dresses and sometimes, every once in a while, you, re you read a really bad fashion history that makes it sound like after the war, it just happened like that. But on Downton Abbey, we've been seeing part of that, uh, that transition period, which sort of started about 1907 and ends after the war that we get into the 1920s. Um, so this is obviously a photo from season one. And this is, on the right, um, this famous Paul Ereve illustration of Paul Poiret's uh, designs and Poiret's um, credit as being one of the designers who was kind of put it, bringing in this very new style that was uh, that could be worn without a corset, although the Crawley sisters certainly still wear corsets at this period. But um, the whole look is a lot straighter. It's not those fuller skirts um, that their mother would have worn, that their grandmother would have worn. Of course, last season we started in the 1920s, uh, so it was sort of a slow kind of loosening and, and the styles getting straighter. Um, the early 20s is also a period that sort of gets forgotten because um, we think of sort of the classic like flapper era, it's like 1925, short skirts, really tiny dresses. Um, the early 20s, sometimes costume designers kind of avoid the early 20s because to our, our eyes today it looks very dowdy mm -hmm. because those, uh, so this is the photo on the left, um, it was very wide and the skirts were still quite long. Um, now it looks like these are two photos on the right that I found um, from season four, so we're really getting into some of the classic 20s looks, particularly on uh, Lady Edith. 
Uh, Lady Mary is actually probably a little bit behind. She's still got that um, defined waistline, a little bit of a kind of longer skirt. Um, and then this is another photo I found of season four, this sort of full cast photo. Um, I could go on and on about the fashion of the period, but um, what was going on in Seattle at the time, and sort of our way into that is, so Rose was a character who was introduced at the end of last season. Uh, she's the blonde on the right in the pink dress. And you'll notice that the dress has kind of these wide hips, which is not really something we associate with the 20s. Usually it's a lot straighter look. But that's a very specific uh, 1920s look that's associated with the designer Lanvin. Um, and uh, Lanvin called these robe de steel. Um, and it was very popular style. It was kind of specific to her, and then designers copied it. Um, she made it for evening. She made it for daytime. And so there's, uh, that, so there's a Lanvin dress in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, there's Lady Rose, and on the right is a dress from Seattle, which I think is a robe de steel. And that is a, a detail from this photo we have in the Mohai collection of the Frederick and Nelson French Import Salon, uh, circa the early 1920s. Um, so French Import Salon obviously means that they are bringing uh, European clothes to Seattle. Um, probably they were making some clothes there, but obviously kind of the, the highest end stuff was you getting it from France and then you would get it fitted to you. Um, chances are in the women at Downton Abbey were probably getting all of their clothes custom made, although it, the 20s was really the rise of the ready to wear even at the high end. So it's possible that they were starting to do ready to wear clothing. Um, what you'll notice in this picture is that there's not a lot of clothes. Um, and that's because it's a very different shopping experience from today. It's not, you don't go in and browse the racks and pick out something. Um, you would go in, you'd have an appointment, um, there would be, someone there who there would be a salesperson you usually worked with who would take you into a dressing room for a private consultation. Um, you'd talk about what kind of events you had coming up, what, you know, where you were summering, what you were doing this winter, what, what kind of things you needed, and they would bring things out. Um, and then when you found something you liked, then they would bring in someone to measure, you, to, to do some fitting and get it uh, fitted personally to you. So Frederick and Nelson is a very remembered store because it lasted into the 1990s here in Seattle. One that's a little more forgotten is McDougal Southwick, which when it closed in the 60s had been in business in Seattle for 90 years, which means it predates all of those stores that we think of. Um, so it, it went through several different name changes. It opened in 1875 um, as the San Francisco store. So probably using that name as bringing goods from San Francisco. Around the time of the Great Seattle Fire, it was called Toklas and Singerman, and if you go to the second floor at Mohai, we have some uh, cases that are supposed to look like shop windows right before the Great Seattle Fire, and the one with the beautiful bustle gown in it is labeled Toklas and Singerman. Um, so they had built a beautiful new building right before the fire, which burned in the fire, along with all their inventory. <laughs> um, but they kind of, they reconstituted and it was sold to new people. It became, it was McDougal Southwick in the 20th century. So. Uh, McDougal Southwick had a lot of firsts. It was a very important store at the time. Um, and I found this great uh, reference to them in 1907. Um, some news, a news item that they put in the Seattle Times. Miss Gladys Allen and Miss Helen L. Igo, two of the buyers of the McDougal Southwick company, will leave Seattle for Europe Tuesday next. Purchases will be made at this time for the fall season. This firm is the first into Seattle, in Seattle to send their buyers to the European markets. This action has been found necessary on account of the increasing demand for exclusive merchandise of high quality. So we know 1907, that's when people were going from Seattle to Europe for buying trips. Before that, um, it's not to say you couldn't get European goods in Seattle, but it would probably be like brokered through someone in New York or an agent that you had, that this is people going from Seattle uh, to Paris or to other parts of Europe. So it also is saying that there's enough demand now by the early 20th century for that to happen. And then the other thing that I really love about this story is that, so the two names at the beginning, one of them was um, Helen L. Igo. So in 1907, she was working for McDougal Southwick. By 1910, she has opened her own store, and in the sort of Downton Abbey period, she's pretty much the biggest thing in fashion in Seattle. She owns a very high-end, very exclusive store, and we know from news, um, news items in the Seattle Times that she continues to go to Paris on buying trips routinely to bring things back. Um, this photo on the right is, uh, the ad on the right is obviously past the Downton Abbey period, but I, it's one of my favorite fashion history things, uh, just because it's this really, really beautiful fashion illustration that she put 
a, an ad for her store in Town and Country Magazine, which is a national magazine, um, that's, that puts this fashionable image against this very clear backdrop of Seattle. She's not pretending that Seattle's New York. She's not pretending that it's Paris. It's this, this fashionable dress, and you've got Mount Rainier in the back, and you've got the waterfront, and, and that's Helen Igo's store. Um, so that's, those are my brief remarks. Um, if you're interested in early 20th century fashion in Seattle, um, I'm giving a lecture at, here in April about Helen Igo and another woman named Madame Thierry who were, um, uh, Madame Thierry was a di designer and Helen Igo was running this store. So if you want to know more, look for that event in April. Thank you all again for coming out tonight. Thank you, Paula, Clara, and Junius. Um, just briefly, I want to remind everyone that History Cafes are a monthly program, the third Thursday of every month. Hope to see you back. Thanks again. Have a good night.